Okay, we're at the last talk this evening in this tent already. And the next one up is Chin Mai. She's uh, from Random Hacks of Kindness. She's a global operations coordinator and she's a community builder. And she's gonna talk about just that, building community. Have a big round of applause. Hello everyone, and uh, a huge thank you for turning up at this late hour. I know it's um, right in the middle of the night and a dry topic at as it is. Um, I am Chinmay, <laughs> I'm a technologist, and I work uh, in the area of humanitarian hacking. Uh, I work with the organization called Random Hacks of Kindness. Uh, it's a global organization uh, which has um, communities around the world building humanitarian and civic tech through hackathons. Um, I'm here today because um, of, uh, of something that uh, I've been experiencing uh, in the recent past, that is the lack of a community to support civic issues and a lack of a community to b support humanitarian issues. Uh, there is a rising trend of issues around the world, and but we don't have a community which continuously supports uh, building technology for such situations. And that's where um, I felt the need of coming to this camp and talking to all of you um, about the need and how you can do it in your own communities um, without the need of a central or global organization to do it. Um, that's what I'm gonna be talking, but I would also like to hear if you have different expectations of the talk, then I can uh, similarly talk according to that. Um, I can give you two minutes if you want to have a different question that answered through the talk. Could you come to the uh, microphone and tell me? No? Okay, super. Um, yeah, so I was talking about the growing need of humanitarian or civic hackers. Let me talk about a few instances. Uh, we've been all talking about digital access, equal digital access for everyone. And one of the issues that uh, countries face is internet shutdowns. Uh, I'm talk uh, this is a map of internet shutdowns that happened in India. And this is in the first uh, half of 2017. So we faced around 79 total internet shutdowns. What I mean by internet shutdowns is that uh, a country or a region decides to cut internet for a specific period of time. In this case, uh, in case of Kashmir, recently they experienced like a two month internet shutdown. So you are unable to get online, you are unable to do anything because of this. So let's, uh, cases like this, and then there is also humanitarian crisis. This has increased over, uh, over the, in the recent past. There have been more humanitarian crisis than there have been a dec in a decade. So there have been earthquakes, there have been, um, uh, hum uh, so there have been um, uh, earthquakes throughout the uh, year. There's climatic changes which have resulted in uh, issues like, you know, uh, cyclones, and there have been um, floods, uh, droughts uh, around the world. Um, and we have also, sorry, coming back to, uh, also issues wherein uh, we have corporate entities um, taking over natural resources. So we have different crises uh, around the world and there is a huge need of humanitarian hackers. And I wanna talk about these three stories and how humanitarian hackers have helped 
in the internet shutdowns in Kashmir, what happened is a group local to Kashmir actually went ahead and shared how, uh, the knowledge of how to use VPNs in Kashmir, and that helped people circumvent, uh, circumvent the internet shutdown and the blockage in itself. So that's one example of how humanitarian hackers have helped. In the Nepal earthquake, uh, this is a group called Kathmandu Living Labs. One of the uh, issues of Nepal was there were no clear maps for the first responders to go and rescue or go and uh, even provide any kind of aid. So a local group in Kathmandu uh, came together and built uh, open street maps with the knowledge of local entities and with the knowledge uh, of their uh, country's uh, survey, uh, survey of Nepal. And this actually helped the first responders uh, have access to areas they did not even have access to. So this is how a local group could help. And in case of Standing Rock, uh, in fact, Standing Rock, uh, one of the issues of Standing Rock was that there was uh, no medium of communication uh, between the tribe that was protesting and the rest of the world. So uh, my parent organization, that's, a Geeks, that's Geeks Without Bounds, actually uh, could help with, res uh, with the help of technologists at the Standing Dry Rock um, tribe in itself to build, bring t uh, internet um, by using a local telecom operator and some technology that was built during uh, previous humanitarian hackathons. So these are three examples talking about three different crises and how humanitarian hackers themselves could bring about a change. That's one of the reasons why I am here uh, to talk about bringing this uh, community alive, bringing this community to your towns, your cities, uh, your countries. Um, there are several ways that we can do this. Uh, one of the things that humanitarian technologies or civic technologies need is and um, continuous understanding and interaction with the local communities. That means uh, we need uh, a group that can exist for years. We need a group. Oh, it's pixelated. Okay, uh, no problem. Uh, that can understand these issues over a period of time and can support the technologies that are built over a period of time. So we need sustainable communities. We cannot have communities which are uh, just coming in to build one solution or communities which can do one hackathon. Uh, that is not a uh, Good, good solution. Sorry, I'm going to the next. The second thing that can be done is that supporting the existing networks in themselves. There are various humanitarian networks. Um, so these are some of the humanitarian networks that exist that are um, that have persisted over the years. Space apps. Uh, is one of the communities run by NASA, uh, which looks at NASA data and um, builds technology for civic um, action. Uh, Digital Humanitarian Network uh, is again an informal group of uh, humanitarians, which over time look at humanitarian technologies and um, critique and support and connect different technology builders uh, to uh, have these technologies ready in times of crisis. In, in fact, 
during the Haiti earthquake, this humanitarian network was one of the uh, reasons why uh, they was uh, they were able to communicate uh, the realities on the ground through uh, the Twitter updates and everything. Uh, similarly, uh, there's of course the humanitarian open street map. Uh, this is also not something that just comes alive in terms of crisis. It's always active and um, it needs maps uh, which are not uh, readily available. And uh, through humanitarian open street maps, you could also um, build projects, uh, humanitarian projects, which could support local communities. So there are existing networks like this. And Random Hacks of Kindness, of course, the network that I belong to, also has been existing for six years now, and we have 30 sites around the world which uh, continuously look at civic tech and uh, humanitarian tech. These uh, organizations also have a repository in terms of the technology that they've built. Uh, in fact, uh, these uh, space apps and random acts of kindness have been active for more than five or six years. So they have open source solutions that you can use for humanitarian uh, um, crisis. And in fact, they have been used in Haiti. They have been used in uh, a, this. Um, they have been used in Australia during bushfires. They have been used. Um, in different, uh, so MSF real recently took one of random hacks of kindness hacks and they implemented vaccination uh, routines through the hacks that were built during these events. So there have been um, multiple hacks or multiple technologies that have been built uh, and there have been multiple methodologies set up by organizations like this, which could be used in your local communities. And it's highly encouraged that not just building something that, uh, that's in local community and that is sustainable, but also having the support of organizations like this. So what happens is you have a uh, repository of knowledge existing, and also you have a global community to talk to, and, and you also have uh, mentors who have experience of working in the field uh, while working with organizations like this. Uh, the third thing that, uh, to increase the number of hackers or to increase the number of people interested in civic tech or uh, humanitarian tech is to look at different demographic. Uh, one of the things uh, that we found hugely successful was working with kids uh, and adolescents. So we worked with communities uh, around the world where kids looked at their own spaces, uh, looked at uh, what they had as issues in their own spaces, and went back and built simpler technologies to amplify those issues. What this helped was to get the communities they live in to come back and say uh, that we want to be more involved in uh, solving these civic issues. We also experienced that when we work with diverse group of people, uh, be it women or be it uh, marginalized communities, uh, we s saw that uh, the methodologies they used were very specific uh, to their community, and that helped in, uh, you know, uh, refining something that would work instead of uh, building something that's very generic that's built by someone who is in probably Europe and US, and uh, you expect that to work in a country like India or Africa. So that was something that we saw um, <laughs> come out well when we worked with local communities and when we worked with diverse communities. And also we understood that 
the problems could be when they're hyperlocal, uh, even if it is European, uh, the problems in Scandinavian countries or if it is European countries, uh, they're not uh, worked upon and overlooked when there are no local communities and when they don't look at local issues. So uh, it's highly important that we work with diverse group of people and you try different methodologies. Uh, in this case, uh, we just uh, decided that we would not do something like a hackathon, but instead we decided to just go mapping with a paper map. And that's what the kids are holding. So when you try these different approaches, the involvement of local communities increases. Um, this is one of the ways that we found um, it to be engaging for local communities. Uh, so I've been talking about local communities. I've been talking about uh, what are the things or networks that are available. But how can you personally help with these local community building? Or how do you um, contribute? And in what capacities can these be done? So there are different things that you could do. One is um, most of these communities or groups um, are don't start because there is no one to take ownership of. Um, I also spoke about sustainable communities. So one of the reasons why people don't take ownership of such communities is because uh, there is a need for sustainable ownership. And that is very uh, tiring. You burn out at the end of um, a few months. So uh, there is a need for a lot more people to volunteer to lead these communities and also to build the next leaders. So that's how uh, you can sustain any kind of community. The second thing is not just hold these uh, communities or build these communities or bring people, build people together. Sometimes just holding one event and taking ownership of one event, it could not be a hackathon, it could be different formats. So to bring humanitarian hackers, you don't have to uh, necessarily format it in a way uh, that you have a technology built by the end of that event. It could just be that uh, you provide a pl platform for people to come and talk. So providing simple things where people can come and discuss politics or discuss technology in an intersection of politics can also be uh, a very good way of involving the community. It takes time, yes, for them to go ahead and be a hacker, but it still helps in a way that there is uh, a sense of understanding of what they're building. There is a sense of understanding of what they're implementing. And that is very important. Um, it also uh, involves people who are not probably technologically capable. Um, and that is important for the reason that uh, technologists sometimes can be very blind um, and sometimes can s build things that are v not usable. When you have people who are not technologists, you, you have different viewpoints and that um, helps you identify flaws and helps you identify usability issues uh, easily. So. That's one of the reasons why you have to hold not just community which is technologically aware or technologically capable, but also something that can lead to discussions. The third thing is you probably don't have the bandwidth to uh, lead a community or you hold a discussion, but you can definitely write a document on the safe practices of uh, using some social media platform, or how to even set up a secure internet network, 
or something like that. So it could be different skills or it could be about using a platform uh, to build a website uh, in a few steps. So these are things, these are skills that as technologists um, we could share and sometimes it's also skills like uh, how do you uh, approach a uh, particular governmental organization just to get uh, your project passed or even um, what are the formats to share um, your technology with the government or a civic body. So there's varied skills that each one of us can share with the community. And even that uh, is go uh, a good way to co um, contribute. The other ways to com uh, contribute is also uh, about connecting different networks. It a local organization could have technologists but could lack nonprofit um, connects. It could have uh, someone who does not understand, um, does understand technology but does not understand UI and UX. Maybe you could connect someone who understands usability. So that's also another way to connect these different communities or enable those different communities. Uh, then most of these civic and technology, humanitarian technology communities don't have sustainable funding. What I mean by that is that they're funded uh, once in a while because there was a mandate to do a hackathon or something like that from a company. But there is nothing that, uh, there are not a lot of funds to build upon the knowledge. There is not a lot of funds to maintain the technologies when they once they are built. So there is a need for uh, funding these communities. Sometimes these discussions are political and there are no funds to uh, support some political discussions, especially let's talk about like net neutrality or if somebody talks about uh, let's talk about uh, unique identity systems for your citizens. So these are things that are highly political in nature and th in that case, these communities don't get funded. So this is one other way to support them. Uh, the third thing could be also to build materials. Um, Earlier I told, told about sharing skill sets. Building materials could be an extension of that. Uh, it could be something that you don't personally uh, feed the communities, but you can write manuals that can be shared with these communities. It could be about ethics, it could be about design, it could be about anything. But these, uh, this sort of helps these communities learn something that's missing in um, a city or a town, but could easily be found somewhere else. Okay. I needed this one pixelated. Is it possible? No? Uh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, while I've, I've been talking about how to do it, um, a lot of these uh, efforts over the past have been well-intentioned, but at the end of it, uh, there, there have been a lot of uh, issues as well. And one of the reasons why these communities uh, have failed is b because we have uh, not addressed these issues and overlooked them and gone ahead and done the same processes over and over again. Um, some of these, sorry, this is actually a picture which was talking about um, a um, toilet which was built uh, in one of the tribal communities and, and 
the picture showed how uh, it was the toilet that was built was used as a grain storage uh, unit. So it spoke about usability phase. Of course, the to building of a toilet <laughs> is well-intentioned. It is something that is solving a problem, but it is not being used by the community the way it should be used. Uh, this has been happening a lot with civic tech and humanitarian technologies. Um, and the reason being <laughs> that uh, these technologies have always been built um, in separation to the communities. They've not been uh, with the communities. They've not been um, built after understanding the needs of the communities. There has always been an alienation uh, with what the needs are and who builds it. Uh, so one of, though we would like to do local communities, there, there are times that privilege plays. Um, because technology is obviously something that's um, known by the uh, by someone who's privileged, and there is always a disconnect with people who use it, and so that leads to a massive failure uh, in terms of how these technologies are never used on ground and never supported. Uh, so. Also, with respect to like ethicality, uh, there is all uh, there is a sense of appropriation that even though you understand the issue, uh, you do not uh, fully uh, see it from the perspective of someone uh, experiencing it, and that also leads to failures of the usage of technology, of building of technology. The third one is, of course, uh, like I said, there is uh, a need for uh, these communities to be persistent, consistent, and that is a hard thing to do. Um, it's hard to f maintain these technologies uh, because uh, A is, the developers who built it um, cannot stay beyond a certain period of time because this is used by someone who is possibly not someone uh, near, uh, near them. So uh, they would have moved to different projects or they would not have funds to work more on the projects or even the fact that uh, the way the uh, the way it is used by the communities uh, is uh, possibly um, harder, and uh, the feedback is not uh, provided uh, to the developers, so it, it goes to waste. So it's very important that when we build these local communities, uh, that we always have an um, understanding that um, we include uh, different groups and we always have an understanding that of our own privileges and our own uh, sense of um, you know uh, 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 sorry uh, our own uh, I'm sorry I'm not I'm unable to get a right word for this. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, uh, you could call it privilege, but to be aware of our own privileges. So that's um, something to think of and something to reflect upon and to work on. Um, well, uh, uh, sorry. 
yeah so, uh, so um <laughs> the words I would um, sorry okay and um, I do want to end the talk here because I am unable to currently put together what I had in mind but uh, I would like to throw uh, the floor open for questions and I would like to answer based on that Okay, Let, let's hear a round of applause, come on. So, questions? Yes. Um, you mentioned that in uh, the event of an internet shutdown, uh, hackers can uh, come in, come into play and uh -huh. try to solve that problem for, uh, for the people. Uh, but do you have any other example of uh, a situation in which hackers can actually improve the living conditions of people? Um, I think I talked about three examples. One was the internet shutdown. The other thing was when I talked to you about the uh, uh, what's uh, I keep forgetting the name of the camp, Standing Rock Camp. So even in this, uh, there was an issue. The issue was that uh, there were protests, but they were con disconnected from the rest of the world. And what happened at the Standing Rock protests was not being relayed to the rest of the world. And this is where, again, the hackers could get involved uh, in building technologies that could help share uh, what is happening or relay these messages. This is one. The second thing, uh, of course, the other example that I was talking to you about was the uh, earthquake where there were no maps in themselves, so the maps were built. The other example that um, I can also give you is about uh, building emergency systems where uh, bushfires in Australia were relayed uh, in real time. Uh, and this is also something that was possible due to technology and due to the fact that uh, you could automate this message sending. Yes. So there are various uh, places where technology can be useful. Um, and it has made a difference. Yeah. Cool. OK. okay. Any other questions? Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, several uh, humanitarian organizations, or at least, well, uh, mm -hmm. helping. It. I was wondering in, uh, if these uh, organizations uh, yeah, often work together. I mean, yeah, you know, they uh, do work together. Yeah, but they do have a specific focus that they, there is not one organization, but there are several. I was wondering about the difference between uh, them in focus. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, they do work on different things. Uh, so the Space Apps Challenge mainly works with data, and they work with uh, uh, Na the NASA data and the governmental data. Yeah. Uh, Digital Humanitarian Network actually works with practices and connecting networks. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is not building technology in itself, but connecting uh, technologies or technology uh, communities with humanitarian organizations and also building processes uh, for usage of these technologies. Yeah. Um, OpenStreetMaps, uh, again, is a, a completely different organization, so they only work with maps. Yes, of course. Yeah, and Random Acts of Kindness, uh, we started out uh, building technology for humanitarian crisis. In fact, our primary focus was humanitarian crisis. Um, and that's how some of our technology got used in Haiti. And then um, they also got used in uh, the hurricanes and uh, hurricane, uh, uh, hurricane disasters in US, certain, uh, certain places. 
Yes. Um, then we moved to civic tech uh, because of the issues that the local communities faced in it themselves. Yeah. And uh, Geeks Without Borders? Uh, Geeks Without so Bounds. Um, yeah, yeah, so Geeks Without Bounds, um, sorry, it's uh, another organization. It's not uh, a completely a humanitarian organization. It used to be a humanitarian accelerator, uh, sorry, humanitarian technology accelerator. Uh, but what uh, they essentially do is work with uh, communities for uh, technology implementation. So in fact, uh, Standing Rock is one of, the, one of their projects where they brought internet to the camp. The other example that uh, uh, of their projects is um, actually looking at um, water uh, networks or water um, pipe networks in Tanzania mm -hmm. and uh, improving uh, uh, the water supply uh, processes by mm -hmm. looking at, you know, what are the uh, different um, points of failure and uh, working with the local uh, agencies to ensure that's possible. So uh, essentially, they work with technology and communities. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one more question. Thank you for, thank you for your presentation. I had a question about um, the gender. Uh -huh. um, a lot of, in my experience, a lot of open source communities are, uh, have a majority of male hackers and developers. Could you share some insights about um, men and women working together in a, in a positive way in, a, in, for instance, humanitarian communities? Um, okay. Um, so uh, we've had a certain amount of success with um, having uh, an equal uh, participation of men and women. In fact, uh, one of the hackathons that uh, we did uh, it, it's more a program, it's more an accelerator program with a hackathon, uh, which we did around uh, gender-based violence uh, in India. We had 50-50 uh, uh, participation of uh, men and women work, coming together and working on issues. So uh, we've had uh, even in different communities, we've had uh, women leading the communities. We've had uh, a lot of women hackers coming to the communities. Uh, one of the things that we found useful was the friendly space policies and also the fact that we choose issues that they align with or they identify with. And that's how we, were, we, were a, we are able to bring those communities to the hackathons. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chimai. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Have a round of applause.